As far as fine dining is concerned, earning three Michelin stars is the pinnacle of cuisine and not something that everyone can achieve. It's very impressive, and the only thing perhaps more impressive is being named the best restaurant in the world. Today we'll be talking about Geranium, located in the city of Copenhagen in Denmark, which we see here on a map that I certainly didn't have to look up for myself. Three Michelin stars, best restaurant in the world, known for pushing the boundaries of cuisine and fine dining, particularly utilizing local ingredients and embracing the world around them with floor-to-ceiling windows surrounding the dining room. And now I've finally found reservations for three random dates in December, and yes, it's somehow farther away just for two guests instead of five. So I can't wait to dig into the wine list here, featuring 2,500 labels and 207 pages. So let's start by laying down a bit of the law. I am the law. We'll assume that no sommelier is available. Despite the incredible wine team here at Geranium, we'll assume that it's Skater's Dog, my favorite holiday. Then we'll assume that the wine list online is up to date and utilize combinations of other people's photos of the menu, YouTube videos, and internet research to accumulate what the menu might look like. Lastly, we'll approach the wine list in five various scenarios. First, I'll approach the wine list in a conventional way, ordering by the glass while being considerate of the menu. Then, I will order one bottle of wine for my Tinder date that says they really want to drink something South African. We'll up the budget to $500, potentially ordering three bottles depending on how I feel. Then, $5,000 and finishing with an infinite budget. So let's crack this wine list open and start working on by the glass. Oh yeah, that's right, we'll have to make currency exchanges every time we make a selection. We just divide by... Well, multi... We use the Google calculator. And oh my goodness, I can order champagne again. Let's go with the Bruno Payard Assemblage 2012. 12 is an extraordinary vintage for champagne and Bruno's a fairly classic producer. Uh, this is going to be a blend of all three major champagne grapes coming from 10 single vineyard sites and spending eight years in the cellar on the lees. Low dosage, so it's going to be dry, crisp, and fresh with that really bready brioche character. The appetizers here on the menu look to be begging for champagne, lobster, clams, artichokes, horseradish, mackerel. Champagne is the answer to all of these dishes. Now the middle of the menu is a bit all over the place, so let's enjoy a wine in a similar fashion. By Tremonti is their Vitaba Albania. This is coming from the heart of Italy and going to be a sort of deep orange in the glass. Wine is aged in clay amphora by a Georgian winemaker, not the state, and is going to spend between 70 and 120 days on the grape skins, bringing out that deep color, that oxidative nuttiness, and well, just a touch of funk. It's a fun and creative wine, just like, well, the dishes I see here in the middle of the menu. For red wine, I really want to prioritize the venison, go for something big and rich, and while there's a few wines here we've already talked about on the channel, let's try something a little different with William Downey's Cathedral Pinot Noir coming from Gippsland in Australia. Now, first of all, who wouldn't want to drink a wine made by what appears to be one of the original members of ZZ Top and a naturally made wine, blending together single vineyards to create a consistent and high quality product without too much intervention in the winery for a fresh fruit driven expression that's going to be absolutely stunning with the venison tonight. So under $150 on by the glass to try a mixture of classic and new age wines, all of which have been cognizant of the menu. Now let's actually spend $150 and pick out a bottle of something South African. Now Denmark isn't exactly celebrated for its relationships to South Africa, but here at Geranium we've still got a pretty cool selection. Hamilton Russell's Pinot Noir 2005 coming from the absolutely stunning Walker Bay. Family owned, estate bottled, and when a winery's tech sheet goes down to break down the precise coopers making the barrels, you know this is a serious production. It's going to be dry, it's not going to be as decadent as something coming out of California, but it's still New World Pinot with all the class and elegance I would look for, not to mention a beautiful touch of bottle age. 
Now we're off to a great start, coming in ever so slightly under budget with some family-owned, heavily aged Pinot, so let's go ahead and up that budget to $500. And it feels good to be ordering champagne again. You know I want to start with a grower, and we've got Jules Broquet's Premisse. This is winemaker Pierre Brochet naming the winery for his grandfather, a family-owned operation here, utilizing all three major champagne grapes to create a really consistent blend. Practicing organic in their vineyards, very low in intervention here with no dosage on this wine. I'm expecting something dry, crisp, and fresh to start the meal. And, you know, Pierre kind of looks like the guy from Supernatural. For white wine, let's do Nicolas Joly's Le Coulis de Seron 2004, 100% Chenin Blanc coming from a single vineyard site in the village of Savignes in the Loire Valley. It's a very oxidative style of wine, seeing some time in barrel combined with 20 some odd years in the bottle almost. This is the producer really at the forefront of the biodynamic movement in the modern era of France, which means we're expecting something very natural in its winemaking approach with still incredible acidity after all this time. Let's finish with something creative, Kronz, Asmanals, and Ullenberg, 2008. Pinot Noir, aka Spätburgunder here in the Rheingau of Germany, produced by a family-owned winery. Its history goes back to 1541, when it was established as a hotel and winery, so an incredible legacy here. I'm expecting something racy and aged in French oak for a touch of spice and real liveliness. This is going to be a great way to finish the meal, and it should be friendly enough with even some of the lighter dishes including the venison. All that currency exchange was making me nervous, but we made it in under budget, so let's crank up the volume here we'll go to 11. Look. and take a look at $5,000 for three bottles on the wine list. And we kick things off with what I think is the most impressive list of Bollinger we've ever seen on the channel, and a 99 VV Francais. So this is a Blanc de Noise, 100% Pinot Noir, farmed from two Grand Cru plots adjacent to the estate. Now these plots were not affected by Phylloxera, a terrible infestation of pests that plagued vineyards across Europe in the 19th century, meaning that these vines are indeed very old, as the VV label would imply. This is going to be decadent, and Bollinger is already a dense and rich style of champagne, so those additional years of bottle age both in the cellar at Bollinger and here at Geranium are going to make for a magnificent start of the evening. I suppose I'm on a German kick these days because I am looking at Egon Müller's Riesling Spätlese Schatzhofberger. This definitely started as a sweeter style of Riesling, but here, coming up on its 30th birthday, I'm expecting something that transcends sweetness. Forever 21, but just turned 30. A blue cheese rounded character that is very unique to German Rieslings with incredible bottle age, petrol, and absolutely extraordinary complexity. Egon Müller is really one of the signature producers producers here in the Moselle Valley, and this is something really special to be cherished tonight. And let's finish with a legend, especially going alongside that venison, 68 Biondi Santi Brunello de Montalcino Reserva. This really is the signature producer of the area. The family is credited with defining the region in the 1800s, and they're on seven generations of family winemaking. 68's a good vintage for Brunello. This is going to be Sangiovese Grosso, so a clone of the Chianti grape, and just a once-in-a-lifetime experience. A 50-plus-year-old bottle of wine like this is something we don't see very often, and this is a surprisingly accessible price considering the legendary status of the estate. It looks like currency exchange rates are working in our favor, and we've come extraordinarily in under budget for really some of the most heralded producers of the areas and wines that I don't see very often. Now let's finish this up with an infinite budget. Now I normally love my grower producer champagne, but when it comes to legendary labels, there is one that stands above all others. There can be only one. The Clota Ambonnet by Krug, 1995. It's first vintage, a Blanc de Noise from a single vineyard site in the Grand Gru village of Ambonnet. This is the most heralded champagne in the world. I really don't think that there's anything that is as celebrated as the Clota Ambonnet. It's certainly not the most accessible price point, but Krug makes a luscious style of champagne, and the Clota Ambonnet is still widely considered one of, if not the best single vineyard champagne on the 
market today. Even though 95 was its first vintage, I expect this to be showing wonderfully as 95 marked a break of terrible vintages in Champagne going back to 1990. Like I said, I'm on a German kick and let's finish with Weingut Keller's Riesling G-Max 2015. It's an absolute baby at this stage, but this is a dry Riesling from Germany, specifically the Rheinhessen, and again, this is probably the most celebrated producer working in all of Germany. The G-Max comes from very old vines at the family-owned estate, which goes back to 1789. This is going to be bone dry, bright acidity, complex, and rich. Again, a once-in-a-lifetime experience in a wine that we just don't see very often, especially here here in the United States, so let's enjoy it while we can here at Geranium. Is there anything more gangster than a warning on the wine list that you're ordering a bottle at your own risk and there's no takesies, backsies? Let's go with the 76 Henri Jaillet Echezeau Grand Cru. That is quite a price and it's somehow still less than some of the DRC here on the list and let me just say that I have never even physically seen a bottle of Henri Jaillet in my entire wine career. That's the level of rarity and specificity we're talking about here. When I refer to wines as once in a lifetime, I mean that chances are, besides what's in the cellar here on this wine list, you really aren't going to see many bottles of this anywhere else and this is an absolutely perfect example of that. When Henri Jaillet passed away in 2001, his nephew took over the estates, but technically Henri Jaillet will never be made again, and 76 is a great vintage for Burgundy, and wildly enough, it's not really that insane of a markup compared to what we could actually purchase here in the United States. Not to claim this is some sort of value or reasonable price point, but it's an interesting note to consider. Now that looks like an infinite budget used to enjoy wines that we probably couldn't drink any other way. Ridiculously expensive, massively marked up compared to their retail counterparts, but boy oh boy this would be quite the dinner. Thank you so much for joining me on Troy's Tasting Room today as we've gone abroad and explored the world at large. We have many, many more restaurants to enjoy, many of them you've offered to the comments, which I appreciate so much. I'm keeping that list ever growing and, well, hey, hopefully I'll hit every single one of them someday. In the meantime, thanks for sticking around. We look forward to seeing you again next week as we dive into another wine list here on Troy's Tasting Room.